Greetings from Dr. Cape. We are now talking about a really important part of our semester, which is the research abstract. Before talking about the nuts and bolts of abstracts, I wanted to share with you an email, and this is a typical type that I receive fairly frequently. This is from a journal that would some would call Vanity Press, meaning that you have to pay to get yourself published in this type of a journal. I'll get these direct requests from, this is actually a real person, sometimes it's not, but the editor of this particular journal saying, hey, we saw an article that you published called, as you can see here, Adolescent Internet Use, etc. And do you have anything else that you want to throw our way? So when I did a little bit more investigating, I found that there is actually what looks like a legitimate journal. However, when I go into it more deeply as far as how would you submit an article for this journal, that's where you'll find that you have to pay, well, if you don't haggle, it could be $2,500 just to get something published, which really isn't how the research world ought to work. But some people, as you're going to try to advance your career, will do this type of um, publication. So it looks like you have more publications in your curriculum vitae, which is basically like a resume. And uh, I'm not at that point, so I say no. And then what typically happens is I will be followed up with, and they'll try to, I guess, sweeten the pot. Maybe they'll cut the price in half, something along those lines, until I say I will pay no amount of money to get my work published. And then they'll go away because that's not what this type of business is. This is called open access which is becoming much more frequent in the research world. The upside is that you can get your research out quite quickly, unlike the typical process where peer review can take months in order to get your manuscript in the content and form shape that a particular journal will accept. So here's just when I Googled some how, you know, to see what's going on with this journal. And it's an example of, if you want to call it flaky journals or just not really legit journals. And those aren't the type that we want to do abstracts from. We want to use instead the peer-reviewed journals that are prominent in whatever our interest is as a field of study. So the first thing we want to talk about in our work now is what is a research abstract. It isn't what you typically find as a paragraph at the start of a journal article. Those are probably limited in number of word count and it's not going to provide enough information for what we're trying to do. If it's single spaced, what you try to do is limit it to one or two pages that's going to go over what the study is in specific areas. The research abstract's not an essay, it's not creative writing. All it is is sectioning off for a given research article what is the purpose of the study, which you ought to be able to find right at the end of the literature review. Right before you get to the methodology, most authors are going to say, start out a paragraph. The purpose of the study is. So a shortened version of that, if there's any research questions or hypotheses, that's where they go. And then identifying what are the independent and dependent variables. So that's one section. Then you're going to talk about in another section, again, these can be bullet points, headings, subheadings, what method, methodology excuse me, was used. 
for that study? How was it employed? Meaning how did it um, go about? So if it's a survey, was it an internet-based survey? How many people were reached? Give me just the nuts and bolts of it. We don't want to be overloaded with information here. I don't need to know, you know that it was at such and such a school and you know the exact dates it was administered or anything like that. Now the results section of an abstract is where you're going to restate the research questions and or restate the hypotheses and what did they find. I don't want you to copy and paste whatever the article presents with the types of analyses they ran and things like that that honestly you probably won't be able to interpret very easily. What you want to put here is what were the um, hypotheses and were they supported or not? And maybe a one sentence explanation for each. You also, before you go into the hypotheses, you could just say what is, you know, in general, things like how many were in the sample and, you know, maybe some brief demographic characteristics. Again, try to make this as easy to read as possible. I don't want you just copying and pasting paragraphs and paragraphs out of the article itself. And then the last section, which is pretty important, is so how good of a study was this? And we'll talk about that shortly, how you're going to determine that. And how does this matter to a profession that is related to that study? So if it's a PR study, so public relations practitioners perhaps, if it's a health communication study, is this targeted toward doctors, nurses, patients? How is this gonna be useful to a profession? So when you talk about the purpose of the study, again, you're gonna look for that as a clue right before the methodology you're going to include these components. So some, like for variables, are pretty simple. If, if the question is, what's the relationship between one's gender and one's recall of a public service announcement for a given health campaign? Gender is an independent variable and probably male, female are the values of that variable. If the recall, which in this case it is, is a dependent variable, so what are the values? Is it going to be some kind of a true-false test of knowledge? And there's 20 questions, each worth one point, zero to 20. The higher the number, the better the recall. That's what we're talking about here. You may copy and paste hypotheses if they're stated, but you also have to indicate for me the variables used, their IVs, DVs, and what their values are. And the operational definition is what I just talked about, where they say recall of a PSA, but what do we mean in that article by recall? And in that case, the recall was a true-false questionnaire, which the higher the number, the better the recall. So that you briefly explain that in maybe two or three sentences per variable. Are they using a theoretic background in this particular research study? If so, just briefly identify Let's say it is the health belief model. If they state they're using that, just briefly both identify it and how they are applying it. The next section then is the methodology section. And in this portion of your written abstract, you 
include information on how many subjects there were. Stimulus materials mean, you know, if it's an experimental design, what kind of a thing did they show a given audience? If it's not that at all, then, you know, what kind of a survey was created? Often with an experiment, they'll follow up with a survey as well. And this is where you talk about what's the procedure they used in the study in as brief as you can without, again, just copying and pasting because an abstract is you're trying to get out just the essential information from a larger piece of work. Look here for if they're using valid and reliable measures. Sometimes you'll find they're using a scale that somebody else created, or maybe they created it in one of their earlier works. What we're looking for are the kinds of tools that they use in putting together the survey to gather data. So what we want to do also is just briefly talk about that. How was it collected? Meaning, was it a paper pencil kind of survey? Was it an online survey? Any kinds of quick information you can get out of that portion under the methodology section. They'll probably say something like they use SPSS, which is what we'll use this semester, the statistical packages for the social science or some other kind of platform. So you just briefly identify that too. Not what they found, but what they used to analyze. And then we get to the results and conclusions section. And again, I want you to copy and paste in the research questions and or hypotheses. Were they supported or not? Confirmation means the hypothesis was supported, meaning when they ran the tests of statistical analysis, they found evidence to support what they predicted. If they didn't, then they'll either say the hypothesis was not rejected or was unsupported. So you state one or the other and perhaps add a sentence or so to make any further explanation than what would be needed. So if it's something interesting, like they actually found the opposite, of what they predicted. So if they predicted males were going to do something more often than females and found the opposite, that would be of interest to note. If there's just no relationship, then you really don't have to go any further than that. So neither males nor females did more or less, depending on what it is they predicted. The end. Usually, will run additional analyses. So let's say gender was our, you know, a difference was hypothesized, didn't find that. Maybe we'll look at like differences in race, ethnicity as an additional analysis or some other demographic kinds of variables. Maybe one's income level matters. Maybe one's uh, class rank, if it's college students might matter. So if there's any additional analyses. You can briefly describe those. And then toward the end, they should be making some very obvious conclusions. I call this the so what factor. So you ran your study. Here's what you found. Now what? What about it? How does this matter? Specific conclusions. And then we'll try as researchers to say, so I found this here, what does this matter beyond my little study that you're reading? Those are overall conclusions. And this part is, I guess, the best, um, as far as if you like to do a little bit more creativity in your writing, because here you're going to talk about, was the study internally valid? 
externally valid? And how does this apply to the profession? Again, this is the part that has a lot of weight to your ability to do an abstract. And finally, what do you think should be areas of future research in the topic area that is part of this? So what's internal validity? You are going to write three questions on your abstract. And the first question is, did the study properly manipulate and or assign values of the independent variable? So it can be relatively easy. If gender is an independent variable and they properly assigned male, female to the values of that variable, then sure, you could answer yes. The study properly manipulated and assigned male, female, the values to gender as the independent variable. But that's not always going to be so simple like that. They might say the independent variable is frequency of social media use. High, low. You have to go into the article and understand how did they get high versus low or low versus high? What was it? Number of minutes per day, number of hours per day? Um, did they say if you had no use up to maybe an hour per day, did that equal low? And if you did an hour and one second or more, that means you have high. That's what you're evaluating. Do you think it was properly assigned the values of the independent variable? Next question. You paste this question into your document and answer. Did the study validly and reliably assess the dependent variables? So again, if they talk about a scale that they used, was that scale a valid and reliable measure that was taken from the literature? They might call it the Smith scale from 2012. And they will state specifically this is valid and reliable. If instead they are describing the scale they created and it was created just for the purpose of the study and was never used before, that would not be considered a valid and reliable scale until it has been tested multiple times because valid and reliable means it is measuring what it intends to measure. It's saying it's a knowledge scale. Is that really measuring knowledge? And also reliable means in this context, if other people use this scale, are they likely to find similar results? That's reliability. Just like if different people measured the length of a piece of paper using a ruler, can we expect that different people are going to get the same measure? Now, it's pretty simple with a ruler, yep. Assuming the ruler is correct, that if I use 12 inch ruler and I'm measuring a five inch piece of paper that within very slight variation, everyone ought to get five inches as far as the length of that piece of paper. That's reliability. The third question has to do with control. Control means that the researchers have Ask the computer to statistically take into account other variables that might be reasons why some result occurred. So let's say we were, for our research question, looking at the relationship between someone's age and someone's likelihood to pay attention to a flu vaccination public service announcement. And we hypothesize that the older someone is, the more likely they are to pay attention to the flu vaccination campaign PSA. And maybe that's what we found in our study. 
However, there are certainly other possibilities of reasons why someone might pay attention. That's what this is about. You read the article and you look for this portion. Did they say they controlled for gender? So they asked the computer to take a look at gender differences in relation to this same dependent variable. And it will say something like, controlling for gender, we still found a significant relationship between the variables that I just talked about. If it says, once we controlled for, oh, let's say, if you had already had a flu vaccination that year, and then there wasn't a relationship, that is a variable not controlled for in the study. So this is one you have to really read carefully and look at the explanation about, and it's gonna include controlled for somewhere within that paragraph and see if there's any discussion of that. Control for can also mean in an experiment, ways that they tried to make the different experimental settings the same. And we're talking more about experiments soon, but this would be things they will actually put into the article, things that they controlled for. It could be the type of room that was used. It could be who was the, um, let's say, spokesperson or trainer in the room. It could be they controlled for time of day. They did all of the studies at the same time of day, etc. That's what you're looking for. If for all these questions, you can say yes for A, B, and C, then it is an internally valid study. If you say no to any of these questions, the study is not internally valid. Now, also, you have to keep in mind that these are published articles that you're looking at. Therefore, it's likely there should be a good effort made at this internal validity. And for C, where it says all other variables, let's say instead of you know, the universe of possible variables that they didn't control for, was there a reasonable effort made for the most likely variables? Did they control for those somehow in the study? And that's internal validity. You paste these three questions in and you answer them, not just yes or no, but give a little bit broader explanation of that. Where is that within the study? Where'd you find that information or lack of it? So again, what's validity? Did it measure what it intended to measure? Was the scale used actually measuring what it intended to measure? So examples of this would be that you'd be familiar with. So you take an exam in a class, did that actually measure the knowledge that you gained for that portion of the class? You know, sometimes there's complaints of that, that no, it doesn't. You know, I knew a lot more than what was asked on the exam. So perhaps argue that's not a valid exam to measure my knowledge. Certainly our questions about that with IQ, you know, test that people take, that it's not really measuring one's intelligence because there's cultural bias in the questions, for example. So you're looking at the measure as far as its validity, and then think of reliability as the reproducibility. If you would do the same measure with a similar group, are you going to get the same results? So I'll often look at, for example, when I'm giving an exam in a class, and if I have multiple sections, I would expect within not too much variation, that there would be a similarity in exam scores. I also would look uh, question by question. 
because sometimes people who do well on exams end up missing questions I don't think they should. And it's okay if people who do poorly on an exam miss a question, but I'll go and look at questions that seem to give trouble for people who know the content. And I might say, that's not really a reliable measure of knowledge. If they're missing the question, the people who are my top performers, and you know, I may just say, well, you know, in the case of, let's say if it's a, a multiple choice, maybe I'll accept more than one answer because of how it's being interpreted by the good students. Or I might just throw out the question in general. That's the kinds of things that relate to validity and reliability. And if the scores are pretty far apart as far as an average for one class versus another, and I might want to look into that more deeply. Why might that be? Like for us, we have an online situation versus an in-person situation face-to-face -face with classes that I typically teach. So I'm going to look for differences with that. Does that mean I would say the exam for an online class isn't reliable or valid? Not necessarily, but it might be the case that things that I thought were clear were not, you know, you weren't doing well as a student on the exam or as a group on the exam. So maybe I need to make some adjustments that way. Now, external validity has to do with generalizability, meaning besides the people that were asked to participate in a given study, who else would these results apply to? That is how generalizable it is. And as the researcher, when I'm writing up my articles, I am going to try to extend the results I found beyond my study participants. And how strong can I make the case for that? Oftentimes we, as researchers, because they're convenient, are studying college students, usually at the college that you work at. No coincidence there. So if I'm doing a study with Whitewater students, can I say with any real degree of certainty that what I found with my Whitewater students can generalize past UW Whitewater. So I might do some examination of the demographic characteristics and see if that is something I can say, well, you know, I have a range of ages as far as college students are concerned. The gender split is reasonable to college students elsewhere. You know, geographically, we could talk about both the location you know, within the United States and also a rural setting versus urban. And you know, how far can I really stretch this? Is my study of whitewater students really going to say, be able to say as the author, these are just like college students all around the country? And the answer is no. We aren't like generalizable that far. So I might say perhaps this is generalizable to other campuses in rural settings or maybe in a certain geographic area. But depending on how the study is set up, you have to not overshoot that. I kind of brag more than it's really worth because people aren't going to believe it. We don't necessarily want our study to be relatable to an entire population. I have the world in quotes here. Like this is all college students in the United States. You know, that might not necessarily be the case. Maybe, you know, my, the point of my study was to look at um, rural universities, medium-sized, and can Whitewater fit that? So if they don't, it doesn't mean they're bad studies. That's what I mean by it's not a criticism necessarily, it just is. So if that's what the authors state, 
this is how far we can push the generalizability of the results. You can make note of that. If they try to push it too far, definitely you want to make note of that, that you think it's unreasonable what they state is the external validity of the study. And finally, I want you to look at professional relevance. What kind of professional might be interested in your, the study that you are abstracting? So, example, when I was doing my master's thesis, it was on local television news and different variables associated with that. And I had news directors interested in my results because the ability to make things more appealing as far as a newscast to a target population might mean you get higher ratings. That's what I mean by professional relevance. So we're looking here beyond our ivory tower, our academic world. How does this fit in the real world? So again, if this is a public relations related study, how might practitioners draw from that study, these results? So I want you to spend some time, again, this is an essay form here, like paragraph form, talking about professional relevance of the study. And how is it a, a contribution to the profession? because honestly, that's what we're going for as researchers. And finally, how does this contribute to what was already known in this area of research? That's what's called the body of knowledge. We're always, as researchers, looking at what is the current state of knowledge? How can we add to the body of knowledge? And how did the study do that? To what extent? and in what ways.